All right. Well, we'll jump in since everybody seems to be here. We're on, I don't know what page this is. We are on the section of The Self Stands Beyond Mind, section eight in I Am That by Sri Nishigadatta Maharaj. And we're, uh, I don't, uh, my electronic copy says page 21, but that very rarely has anything to do with what everybody else is seeing. Swami, it is page 18 around 18. the middle of it. Yes. Okay, around the middle of page 18. That's only true for a few more minutes. But <laughs> Ever changing, non repeating, constant newness of the moment, and every bit of it describing the beauty and love and <clears throat> bliss of the divine. And, uh, you know, I got in trouble in D.C. for having my cup of coffee. I hope you guys excuse my bad habits. <laughs> I wear them like bangles, though, anyway. All right, so <clears throat> our, uh, our questioner this morning uh, has just been told that you know what's best. You know what you need in your spiritual life. And, uh, you know, that gift comes not too far from, well, it depends, I guess, on how on earnestness and sincerity. Everything in spiritual life really depends on earnestness and sincerity. You know, you can you can whisk through this this whole process rather quickly if you if you're earn, really earnest and really sincere, really apply yourself to it. And of course, grace. Grace always comes in there. So you can't really make statements like that. Because mother is always going to come along and just give somebody everything for seemingly nothing. <laughs> but this is the beauty of it. This is the thing. So he's been told, you know, you know what you need to know. And that's the important thing. All of us do. It's a matter of honesty. Uh, that's why uh, uh, Ramakrishna said that in this yuga, truth, truthfulness is the real austerity. Uh, we, because we've, we've got, we're such an age of presentation, how we present ourselves, you know, what, what our image is, what our, and that, you know, I remember driving back from the airport in San Francisco after picking Swami up from, from the, air, uh, the airport there one time, and up on the side of that big hill that you pass was a giant billboard for a camera that said, image is everything. And I remember Swami and I read that. Swami read it out loud because he sometimes had this habit of reading things along the side of the road and always making some amazing comment about it. <clears throat> but he saw that image is everything. And he just looked at me and smiled. <laughs> it's like, that's the problem. That's exactly it. We've created this image that we've identified with and we nurture it and we master it. We polish it. Um, and now we're trying to lose it. <laughs> so, but if, in and behind all of that, you know yourself. That's how you're able to know that you're not realized at this moment. You're like, gosh, something's off. I can tell. <laughs> Don't know what it is. Something's off. And so attaining that level of inner dialogue where, it, where we're truthful with ourselves. And it's easiest to do when we detach from ourselves because when we're attached to ourselves those things are hard to hear we don't like them we don't we don't want to look at them and so much of vice in this world is practiced purely to forget that inner pain to forget this inner experience of suffering from our ignorance from not knowing what we are who we are what the, what what anything you know what are we to do what are we to think what are we to be what's our purpose all of those ideas <clears throat> come up empty. We don't know the, the, because really even in, even the questions themselves, when you put them in light of, of our real situation, the questions themselves don't even make sense and will lead you in a wrong direction. Because reality, the reality of our moment is significantly different than it appears to be. There's no doing, there's no, no purpose, there's no causation. Uh, there's no change. There's no time. And so when you're standing in a place of no change, no time, of absolute one without a second and pure being, and you're standing there asking yourself, what am I supposed to be doing? <laughs> uh, 
even the question causes causes confusion when you sit there and think what do i need to do well how do i realize you know how do i become all of these questions when you look at the absolute reality of the truth our highest ideal which we don't do enough we spend a lot of time on this end of the spectrum but if we go to and then just for the fun of it because we can't really do it but come up with that understanding of the implications of one without a second one uh, and uh, to come up with just sort of a working knowledge it's a fake working knowledge because the mind can't a- actually conceive of it but we can work with it and understand implications of it and understanding those implications will help us kind of decode daily life decode the illusion uh, of all the rest of it and and stop the confusion because it's our questions themselves the quest itself the the exercise in in becoming enlightened or becoming spiritual uh, you know those those are helpful <laughs> sort of in the same way a cat pushes things toward the edge of the counter it's like they're helpful they they kind of make us begin to question the whole paradigm and uh begin to start short circuiting things when start when things start short short circuiting in your mind that's a great sign when you when you sit there and get start getting caught up in a problem and then just suddenly break out of it with like what is this this is just thinking forget it everything's fine and you kind of return to that place return to inside pull yourself back from the story for a moment when that starts happening it's a wonderful time in spiritual life it's it's a, it's a time of you know little little moments of peace and little moments of laughter when we realize the joke, uh, you know, and, and how we keep doing this to ourselves uh, in a playful way. It's, you know, it's our own self playing with our own self in our own ignorance, uh, keeping this game alive. And when we draw near and begin to think these things or let these things permeate through us, uh, there's a reason that Takor laughed so much. There's a reason that he was so blissful, uh, even in the midst of everything going on in the world. Uh, and that is because we start to get the joke. We start to get the fun and realize, <laughs> look at this, <laughs> how clever. So we're going to see it right here this morning in this next question from, from our devotee sitting in his presence in uh, Maharaj's Nishagadatta's pre- presence, my tongue, oof. I am restless. How can I gain peace? This is a common, our common question, right? And look at his wonderful answer. For what do you need peace? <laughs> Why do you need that? When the questioner falls right into the trap. To be happy. I need peace so I can be happy. Maharaj, are you not happy now? No, I'm not. What makes you unhappy? I have what I don't want, and I want what I don't have. That's a great way of summing it up, isn't it? That's our. That's really a great statement right there. As funny as it seems, that's pretty much the way that it is. We just we've got we've got everything we need. We're all well fed. We're all housed. Most of, we're clothed, as far as I can tell. We're doing we're doing fine, and yet in the middle of that, we're like, mm, I want peace. <laughs> I, I want inner bliss. I want, I don't know. I want fried chicken. <laughs> you know, anything that's not there, and we don't want what we do want. So it's a great way of stating it. Now, Maharaj is a great, very straightforward, absolutely great answer. Well, why don't you invert it? Why don't you have why don't you want what you have and care not for what you don't have? Why not just flip it around? And you see, this is a, this is wonderful because on one sense, you could get angry about this answer. You know, I know there was a point in my life if I went to a Swami and had this conversation, I would have rolled my eyes and been like, oh, God, thanks. <laughs> and then I walked away. But there's so much truth in this because this is totally possible. In this moment, you can change your mind and the way that it works just with a different thought but you know what won't allow it? Your karma. And you say to yourself, oh, this pesky karma. 
Well, fool, the thing is, the karma works on you because of your identity with it. You won't let go of it, so it affects you. And not only that, but you've set up rules in your mind that you can't just be happy without a reason. You see, because your karma teaches you, you have to have a reason. You have to have a cause for that effect. That's our attachment to karma, is insisting, no, there must be a cause for this coming effect. So I can't just decide to be happy. That's not real happiness. That's kind of fake happiness. But in fact, that is real happiness. And that's the best you can, ever, best do. You can ever do, as long as you're in the yeah, mind. Sure the... Oh, goodness, somebody's, let me mute everyone here. I scared myself there, be hearing my rip my thing. Okay, mute all. So feel free to unmute for anything, all right? But this attachment to karma, this, this is what has to stop. <laughs> you can't live in this moment. You can't be in the moment. You can't be in the presence in a, full, uh, in a fully uh, inundated way, in an overwhelming way, until, until you're willing to let go of this story, the karmic story, uh, the cause and effect story, so that you can have this kind of power. You can just say to yourself, I'm happy. And if you have that, that singularity of thinking, which is that, that, that concentration, which is that ability to stay in the moment without being dragged into your, your story of cause and effect, your past and your future, if you can with single-mindedness say, I'm happy, boom, done, you're happy, you're fine, I'm at peace, boom, done, you're at peace. Because that's all it takes. Your whole world is just a sequence of thoughts at this moment. Your whole state of being, your, your opinion about where you are in life and what your net, what your happiness state is, what your accomplishment state is, is all just thought. It's just an arrangement of thoughts that you've collected and are hugging very tightly and loving them as much as your grandchildren or your husband or bubblegum. I don't know, whatever it is you love. You're holding on to these things. And it makes this statement insulting. This statement is not insulting. The insulting part is that you won't let yourself be free. You won't let yourself define the moment as perfect because you say, no, it needs a reason. And I have all these reasons to not be happy, to not be content, to not be fulfilled, to not be at peace. And you look at your reasons. What are you looking at when you look at all of your reasons? You're looking at your karma. And why do you feel that karma? Because you, you cherish that karma. <laughs> you hold on to that conditioning. It's a, it's a place of comfort because it maintains a lie of, of doership in there, a, a lie of responsibility, which comes with great things and comes with awful things. That's the nature of the world. So why don't you invert it? Want what you have and care not for what you don't have? Questioner, I want what is pleasant and I don't want what is painful. Maharaj, how do you know what is pleasant and what is not? Questioner, from past experience, of course. Maharaj, guided by memory, you have been pursuing the pleasant and shunning the unpleasant. Have you succeeded? Hmm, there's a wonderful question. So as long as you're guided by memory, which is guided by karma, guided by your story, your, cause, your story of cause and effect, your story of past and future, if you depend on that, for your identity. This is what he's saying. If you get guided by that, guided by memory, you have been pursuing the pleasant. Yes. And shunning the unpleasant. Yes. Have you succeeded? What a wonderful question. Is that working for you? Wonderful question for us. <laughs> you know, is that working for you? You know, I remember, <laughs> I heard, well, that, that'll be offensive to some people. I'm going to tell this story. It could be offensive to some people. Don't be offended. It's not told for that reason. It's just told for the for, for kind of the fun of this. You know, the the other day, this woman was talking in the art studio about one of her relatives, one of her uncles, and he's a big anti-vaxxer and and uh, all of that. And and she's she's the opposite. She's really into the vaccines and has all of that. And she she just caught uh, a COVID, and it was very mild. It was gone in like two days, and her her friend, her uncle came to her and said, I told you those vaccines were nothing. 
And uh, he, she says, oh, well, she says, I, I got it, but I, I didn't, ho wasn't hospitalized. I'm over it in two days. He says, yeah, but see, they don't work. And she's like, well, how many times have you had COVID? He said, four. And she said, well, it's working better than yours is. <laughs> you know, we've got these ideas in our head that we hold on to our idea. Here, this guy had had COVID four times, you know, and was bragging about the, efficient, the, the efficacy of not being vaccinated, which is fine. I'm not making opinions about that. I'm just telling a story. And this guy and, and this woman who hadn't ever had it and had a very mild case of it got over it immediately. And he's actually, you see, if we live in that, that egoistic perspective, that state of, of you know, <laughs> hanging on to our karma up there, we look ridiculous, you know, making a statement, see, it doesn't work. <laughs> Mine works. I've only had it four times. You've had it one time. That does, that's a mess. <laughs> but that's how it is when we hold on to our story, when we hold on to this idea of past, present, future, you know, and cause and effect and cling to the responsibility because that responsibility gives us rewards and it also gives us punishments, which we endure. You know? So he says here, have you succeeded? It, by Is this working for you? Is your life, is, can you see the moment as perfect using the method of following your memory? And he says, no, I haven't. The pleasant does not last and pain always sets in again. Which pain? Question, questioner, the desire for pleasure. The fear of pain, both are states of distress. Is there a state of unalloyed pleasure? Maharaj, every pleasure, physical or mental, needs an instrument. Both the physical and mental instruments are material. They get tired and worn out. The pleasure they yield is necessarily limited in intensity and duration. Pain is the background of all your pleasure. You want them because you suffer. On the other hand, the very search for pleasure is the cause of pain. It is a vicious cycle. You see, because this idea of the pleasure, that this search for pleasure is the cause of pain, is telling us your attachment. Because what is the search for pleasure? It's, it's attachment. It's thinking these things are mine. Even the aversions are attachments. You know, attachment for something other than what's being supplied. So we are adverse. We have an aversion to, to things. So you see all of this swirls around this whole practice of finding the present moment perfect. And all of this swirls around the idea of where, can, where, where do you have to be as a sense of self in order for the moment to be perfect, right? Because we've mentioned the moment's not perfect for mind. So if you're identified with mind, it's going to be things of the mind that create an imperfection in the moment. If you identify with the body, it's going to be the things of the body that prevent the moment from being perfect. Because the moment will never be perfect for a body. Because the body has nothing to do with the moment. The moment will never be perfect for a mind. Because the mind has nothing to do with the moment. Right? The body is always perfect for the self. The eternal, ever-present, all-encompassing oneness. Everything is itself. And within itself, there is perfect equilibrium. There is no change. There's no need. There's no hunger. There's no imbalance. But identify with only a part of the whole, and there's always imbalance. Always partial understanding. Always some suffering. Always something not proper. So our very quest for pleasure, just like our very, oh goodness gracious, I just, back to page 22. So this, this, this whole swirling around uh, in, in this unknowing, identified with things that have nothing to do with us. And so this is the cause of our pain. Our search for pleasure is the cause for pain. Our search for enlightenment is our, a cause for our discontent, unhappiness. And it comes down to such an unusual situation. It comes down to something that we just can't accept to be true. You are realized. There's nothing to be done. You're not the doer. You as the dissatisfied thinker are unreal. That is not you. That's a mask you're wearing. 
The face behind the mask is beautiful. The face behind the mask is content. But you're identified with your mask. And you're sitting there behind your mask saying, ooh, why, why this? Why that? And there is no why this or why that. You have to allow yourself to be. Give yourself permission through grace, through the permission of the divine, to let go, to let go of story and to, and to, to transcend it. It's like in the morning, you know, you lay there in bed not wanting to get up. Look at that whole situation. It's a beautiful absurdity. You know, you have to get up. You don't want to get up. Why do you want to get up? Because the immediate feeling in the body, right? The body is, oh, these sheets are so warm. This pillow is so soft. It's just, these eyelids are so heavy. It's wonderful to be here. And yet at the same time, you're under stress, aren't you? At the same moment, you're not getting up is causing you stress. Why? Because you know you're going to be late. You know you're going to have to cut your, your, your practice short. You know, and you're feeling both happy and guilty at the same time about that. <laughs> like, and so you're in this terrible state of struggle. All for what? For what? Because the story being told is that I'm more comfortable lying in bed right now. When you can see that that story is false. Because it's causing you stress as you lay there. And then you're having to escape from reality. You're having to make yourself stop thinking about all the reasons you need to get out of bed. So that you can roll over and fall back to sleep. Gosh darn it. <laughs> you know? So you see all of life is encapsulated just in that experience of getting out of bed in the morning. The macrocosm and the microcosm are the same. Over and over and over and over again. We are in the, we are in the Garden of Eden. We are in our internal bliss. Absolutely. And then we see something of the senses. We see something of the body. You know, something beautiful. In this case, it's warm sheets and a soft pillow and the idea of an infinite morning that doesn't have anything that needs to be done. And it makes, the, it makes it, you know, it creates this impossible object of desire, which you can't have <laughs> because you've got things to do and you have to get out of bed. But we look at that piece of fruit and we're like, no, 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 that's beautiful. That looks like that would be really delicious. That would be so satisfying. I could lay here and I could get some extra sleep and then I could get up and then I would be whole and then I would be rested and happy and could be, have a great day. But that's never the case, is it? Even those days when you let yourself sleep in, you wake up what you're more groggy than you normally are. You see the untruth of it. You know, the day is already a half a step behind and it just stays that way for the whole day. That we won't let go of that story. <laughs> we won't get out of bed on time. You know, we just won't let go and face and face the real and that's you see how silly that problem is none of our problems are any bigger than that <laughs> none of our problems are bigger than that you know that's that's another problem we find some thoughts to be bigger and more important than other thoughts no they're just thoughts every one of them a complete weakling in and of itself completely unable to give you or take anything from you it's just nothing it's just our being convinced. No, that thought gives me something. No, that thought costs me something. No, that thought is nice. No, that thought is bad. They're just thoughts. <laughs> They're the exact same thing. Every one of them is exactly the same. It's your identity with content, your imagining of content, which drags in your past, your future, your cause and effect, and lies to you about your current condition. This is what he's saying. Every pleasure... Physical or mental needs an instrument, right? It's, what is that? It's going to be a body or a mind. Both the physical and mental instruments are material. Both are not real. Your mind and your body are not real. They get tired and worn out. The pleasures they yield are necessarily limited in intensity and duration. Why? Because your, your mind and your body would burn up. <laughs> would burn up if that little nozzle broke. And the whole of, of pleasure, the whole of, uh, of realization came through at one time. You know, look what happened to Takur every time. You know, it's boom, gone. You know, couldn't talk to him. He couldn't talk to you. He couldn't move. <laughs> you know, it's like this, this is what would happen if, if that little nozzle, you know, was removed. And that nozzle is ignorance. You know, that nozzle's ignorance. Pain is the background of all your pleasures. That's how you know you're feeling pleasure. 
because you're not feeling pain. You want them because you suffer, right? The whole thing is suffering, not just the pain. The pleasure is also suffering because you know it goes away. You know that it's short. That th There's nothing more ruinous of a vacation than to keep track of the number of days you have left. <laughs> there is no better way to ruin a vacation than sit there and count the days of vacation while you're on vacation. It's a horrible thing. And yet there's a knowledge in the back of your mind through the whole vacation that this is going to come to an end, right? And then when it does come to an end, you're back in the office. What are you thinking about? Oh, God, it's only a year to my next vacation. <laughs> you know? And why? Why, 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 why? It's just an exchanging of thinking, an exchanging of thoughts. There's nothing real. There's no problem. Everything is beautiful by nature. Not because anybody has made it that way, not because you're ignoring things, but because you're knowing, you're knowing that, you're knowing the absence of things. So the questioner says, well, I can see the mechanism of my confusion, but I do not see my way out of it. Yeah, okay, this is true, sure, great, now what, right? So all I can do is stay confused, oh, sorry. I can see the mechanism of my confusion, but I don't see my way out of it. Maharaj, the very examination of the mechanisms shows the way. After all, your confusion is only in your mind, which never rebelled so far against confusion and never got to grips with it. It rebelled only against pain. Uh-huh. You see, so we've only rebelled against pain. Pain is the only thing that gets us moving, which is why Mother... <laughs> which is why mother built it into the system. We would just sit here in blah land, you know, completely stoned out of our mind on all of our pleasures and problems and, and be completely lost if mother didn't put in this little constant nudge. If she hadn't made all of the blankets in Maya six inches too short, you know, we would, we would find one and we would snuggle down and die in discontent with, with nothing more. So he says, so all I can do is stay confused? Maharaj, be alert. What's he saying? Pay attention. Go inside and watch this crazy booger mind of yours. You don't watch it because you think it's you. And because you think it's you, you let it get away with all kinds of things because you think that it's you. <laughs> right? He says, go inside. Begin paying attention. You'll start seeing that your mind is not as powerful as you think. You'll find that it's not as, dis, as, as insane as you think, that, that it's of no consequence in the end. When you pay attention, that's the final thing you learn. What am I doing with this thing? <laughs> Why am I believing this thing? You know, it's always the amazing thing. You can have, I look at my family, you know, we all grew up under the same circumstances. We all grew up eating the same foods and enjoying the same company and living in the same house, uh, you know, following the same trajectory of life. And yet you look at everybody in my family and we are all in radically different, radically different places in the world with radically different levels of satisfaction and happiness and fulfillment. Why? Because in all of that sameness, we kept a private little world that was our own, each one of us. And we collected partialities from our experience of growing up. And we gathered a different set of partialities, each one of us. You know, it's like walking through a big meadow together and everybody picks their own flowers. And at the end, you see the three-year-old just picked a whole bunch of, you know, grass and, <laughs> and, a, and a thistle flower. But he won't let go of it. It's a pretty thistle flower. And somebody else walks through the same field but picks all of those spring flowers, you know, it's that, it's that. What, what are you picking? <laughs> what are you holding on to? So be alert, start paying attention to what you're holding on to, to what's attracting you and why. Question, observe, investigate, learn all you can about confusion, how it operates, what it does to you and others. By being clear about confusion, you become clear of confusion. You begin to see how your mind works. You begin to see these little things 
There's nothing more satisfying than the first time you catch a thought before it becomes powerful. The first time that you catch, you catch your lust before it takes charge of you. You catch your anger before it manages to, to overrun you. The first time that that happens is a great joy. And part of the great joy is to realize how simple it was, how unnecessary all of the, all of the other angst was that you had had around it. That's the joy of spiritual life. And you see, this is why religion these days is so disrespected, because we've lost this approach to truth. We've made it as some experience, some vapid experience of just belief-oriented thinking, philosophy-oriented thinking. This is not at the, at the heart of it. At the heart of it, it's be alert, pay attention, question. Question everything you see inside, everything that's running through your mind. Say, is that true? Is that permanent? Is that real? Has that always been the case? You know, when you sit there, I, I remember, <laughs> this is a silly story, but, I'm, you know, in San Francisco, I would take a walk every day and uh, for an hour for, for exercise. And <laughs> there were several different ways I could walk. If I walked to the left, that was in the Presidio. It was nice in the woods. It was very na natural and nature-oriented, some beautiful views. If I went straight down the hill that went for a, a walk along the San Francisco Bay down you know, along, along the, the parks down there in Fort Funston. And that was a beautiful walk. If I walked to the right, well, that got a little gritty into the city, you know, it was kind of the, the, the hood, but a very fascinating walk. If I walked up Fillmore Street, that was the commercial area, lots of little boutiques and bookshops and little cafes and groovy stuff like that all over. You know, so I would always come out well, for my walk every day and I'd stand there at the railing kind of looking at the beautiful view in San Francisco and thinking, mm, what walk should I do? And that's very engaging for the first few months, right? After the first few months, I'm just, I'm like, I'm so over having to make the decision. <laughs> what? I don't care. Just go for a walk. Yeah, but what do you want? I don't, I don't want anything. I just, want to, I just want to walk. You know, but you go out there and you're confronted with decisions all the time. And so eventually I just thought, I just decided, okay, I'm just, just, shut, just shut up. <laughs> just walk. Don't even imagine where you're walking. Just walk. Just go out, walk down the stairs, and just keep walking until an hour's finished. Stop thinking about it. So I started doing that. That was so much easier. <laughs> it was just so much easier. Just go. Just go and walk. Do your thing. And living life like that, that's surrender. Just grabbing mother's hand and say, whew, here we go. Right into the new day. Right? with the mother. Everything's perfect already. This day is already a great day. Whatever happens, whatever comes, this is going to be great. And you watch and you see how that gets attacked. You know, you see something happen and you see the mind react to it. You're like, mind, there's no need. Don't react to that. The day is perfect. Keep going. Just go forward. You know, and you let go and you go forward. Oof, you escaped one. You know? Then you smell something. Oh, I want pizza. <laughs> Mine, no. Just enjoy that smell. Isn't that a beautiful smell? What a wonderful smell of pizza. See how perfect the day is. It even has the smell of pizza. Go forward. Don't get caught. So you don't let that, that smell of pizza become a desire for pizza. You just go forward. You see? And this is how it is. Take the mother, declare the moment perfect, and stay with it. And watch watch like a watchman at war watch the mind see how the senses will try to bring up your discontent will try to take advantage of your smallness to try and take to stir ignorance in there and you can watch it you can see it because it all happens in front of you you are consciousness itself you are awareness itself everything is in your purveyance you can see it all so he says be alert question observe investigate, learn all that you can about confusion, how it operates, what it does to you and others. By being clear about confusion, you become clear of confusion. There's a t-shirt slogan right there for you, right? By being clear about confusion, you become clear of confusion. So it's a great little thing to run through your mind, to stay present, because this is what staying present is. It's staying in that space of unaffectedness and observing. That's what being in the moment is. Standing in that, that place of no change within you. That, 
the beloved sweet home right there, just standing in that knowledge, in that awareness, that peace, and observing. That's that's all of life. There's there's nothing more necessary. From that observing, the more pure that observation becomes, the more unaffected your your yourself becomes by what's being observed, by 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 all of that. In comes that bliss. In comes that knowing. In comes that confidence. In comes that freedom. You know, because what you're seeing over time becomes clearer and clearer and clearer. This is my beloved. Everything, everything here, there, and beyond is ba is based in a, a love, a magical love, <laughs> because it's unconditioned. None such thing. How is that possible? This is the reality. This is the still point. This is the point of observation from within. And so live like this, he says. The questioner says, well, when I look into myself, I find my strongest desire is to create a monument, to build something which will outlast me. Even when I think of a home, wife, and child, it is because of a lasting, solid testimony to myself. Maharaj, right. Build yourself a monument. How do you propose to do it? See, he doesn't push against it, non-resistance. But you see this wonderful thing in here. Look at this guy's desire to build a monument, uh, something that will outlast himself. Is that not pointing directly to God? God is the monument that outlasts all time. So you see, anything that we want to do in this world is always and always founded upon a desire to express our divine nature in the world of, of the changing, right? Everything, every desire is, is an attempt to recreate our divine self in the ever-changing world. And the frustration is we can't do that. It's the painter falling in love with the painting. It's the person looking in the mirror, falling in, falling in love with his reflection. You know, this, this is why it's not fulfilling. This is why it's so challenging. So Madhra says, so, so right, so build yourself a monument. <laughs> no problem, don't resist. Build a monument. How do you propose to do it? Questioner, it matters little what I build as long as it is permanent. <laughs> See, now look at that. This is not exactly what we do, right? It matters little what I build. Okay, so we get that out of the way. As long as it's permanent. Well, there's the problem, you goon. How you've just set up an impossible task for yourself. You're going to build something permanent in a world in which nothing is permanent? Okay, enjoy your unhappiness. <laughs> you have just contend you've just condemned yourself to a lifetime of unhappiness. This is why we observe and why we question and why we look. Because had he been questioning and looking, he would have seen the absurdity of his own attempt. He would have seen this, <laughs> this is foolishness. What a thing. How am I doing that? What is permanent in this world? And this is where, Ram, where Prabhupada would look at you from across the table. He would say, very good but perhaps you already have a per permanent monument to yourself and all you need to do is find it. <laughs> this unchanging eye, you know, it is already your permanent monument of self. Stop, stop trying to get what you already have. It matters little what I build as long as it is permanent. Maharaj, surely you can see for yourself that nothing is permanent. Thank you. Now, how nice to be able to say that to yourself. Everything wears out. Everything breaks down. Everything dissolves. The very ground on which you build gives way. What can you build that will outlast all? The questioner. Well, uh, yeah, intellectually, verbally, I'm aware that all is transient. And yet somehow my heart wants permanency. I want to create something that lasts. What a beautiful freedom. You, you, you can read this in two ways. You can read it and assume the truth of what he's saying. You'd be like, oh, alas, look, we all suffer together. <laughs> we're, all, we're all in the same painful place. Or you can look at this and say, yeah, I'm aware that all is transient. Well, are you aware? 
Are you aware? No, you're not. If you're trying to build something permanent, you're obviously not aware of all things being transient. So stop lying to yourself about your level of knowledge, whether it's intellectual or not. If you're trying to do something impossible, you're not smart. Don't tell yourself smart and that you're just somehow a victim that has to go build something permanent. You see, watch, observe, question, understand your confusion. He says, intellectually and verbally, I'm aware that all is transient, and yet somehow my heart wants permanency. Indeed it does, because that's its nature. That's what you are. That's what you've given up, what you've, what you've suspended your belief about in this experience of having a body and a mind. You've chosen not to, not to view the self, the soul. Maharaj, then you must build it of something lasting. What have you that is lasting? Neither your body nor mind will last. You have to look elsewhere. Questioner, I long for permanency, but I find it nowhere. Maharaj, are you yourself not permanent? Questioner, I was born. I will, I will die. Maharaj, can you truly say you were not before you were born? And can you possibly say, when dead, now I am no more? You cannot say from your own experience that you are not. You can only say, I am. Others, too, cannot tell you, you are not. Questioner, but there's no I am in sleep. Maharaj, before you make such sweeping statements, Examine carefully your waking state. You see this right here. This, boy, this is a bedrock for us right here. Because we make these sweeping statements, these grand conclusions. that We think that we believe, that we think we know. But we haven't done any study. We haven't studied it at all. You know? <laughs> There's so many things like this. We make these grand statements. You see them online all the time. You see these... <laughs> I'm trying to think of one that I read just yesterday and read it. It was just infuriating. Someone was making some crazy conclusion from some very, some very partial information. And this is what we do. It's called ego. It's what living in ego is. The, you know. So he says, before you make such sweeping statements, examine carefully your waking state. Do your homework. Go inside and pay attention before you come outside telling me what's in there before you make these grand conclusions, because that's, that's, that's ignorance. When you make grand conclusions without grand studies, <laughs> when you draw grand conclusions without grand knowledge, right? And that's what happens when we go to a, to a holy soul and we ask our questions. We sum up our ignorance and we come up with some question that we really believe is a good one, just like this guy did. And when we sit there and examine it, had we just silently sat with the teacher, it would have occurred to us itself. That's absurd. That, that doesn't work. That doesn't fix. There is nothing permanent. Right? Before you make such sweeping statements, examine carefully your waking state. You will soon discover that it is full of gaps. Right? The, the, as soon as you go inside and start actually paying attention to what's going on in this mind, what's going on in your thought processes, immediately you'll see, oh my God, those are huge leaps. I'm making huge leaps over areas of nothing, right? You will soon discover that it's full of gaps. When the mind blanks out, notice how little you remember, even when you're fully awake. Yes, boy, this is a great exercise. Right now, tell me what you did yesterday, Joe. You know? Tell me moment by moment what you did yesterday. How much, how far can you get? <laughs> right? It's like sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I'm not even sure yesterday happened. <laughs> like I have no idea. I have nothing to show for it. <laughs> the only thing that makes me suspect something happened is I'm tired. That's the only way I know. <laughs> right? Wake up. You know, spend a moment with the moment. Spend a moment in freedom. You know, wake up in the morning and stand there and look outside and don't say, oh, another day. It's not another day. 
It's an eternal moment and you're absolutely free in it. And this day can manifest anything. You could walk out that door and keep walking in a straight out, straight line for as long as you want. Completely different from anything you've ever done before. And it will have completely different results from anything you've done before. So don't let the day present itself to you as something unusual, something ordinary, because no day is ordinary. Every passage of time is a flipping out miracle, inexplicable and beautiful, incredible. <laughs> this is what the divine is. This is spiritual life. So wake up to that. Know in this moment you are and can be anything. You are not limited by that pathetic story of your tiny past. None of these things are there. Notice how little you remember, even when fully awake. You just don't remember. A gap in memory is not necessarily a gap in consciousness. Questioner, can I make myself remember my state of deep, deep sleep? Maharaj, of course. By eliminating the intervals of inadvertence during your waking hours, you will gradually eliminate the long interval of absent-mindedness, which you call sleep. You will be aware that you are asleep. Right? This is the practice, coming to know the self. The self is ever-present. Right? The self is ever-pure. And if we, if we get in the practice of being aware of our awareness, instead of aware of our senses, instead of aware of our thoughts, stay more aware of our isness in the moment, our freedom in the moment, and refuse to be defined by it, refuse to be limited by it, and act only from within, act only from love, inspired. Movement that's inspired spontaneously by the by what you are, by your by your love, by your wisdom, in this mystery of being. Yet the problem of permanency, of continuity, of being is not solved, Maharaj. Permanency is a mere idea. All right? So he's coming to that same teaching. It's a mere, it's a mere thought. It's a wave in the mind. It's a concept. Permanency is a mere idea born of action in, of time. Time, again, depends on memory, right? Because if there was no memory, there would be no knowledge of change, right? I'm going to close my door here just a second. All right, this memory is, is not just a list of things that have been done or whatnot. It's also, it's also our concept of time. It's also our concept of change. But see, we always have to take something that doesn't exist and compare it to what does exist in order to come up with those concepts. So it shows you, you can't do that. <laughs> you can't take half your argument from something that's unreal, like memory, something that has no existence, like the past, and compare it to the only real thing, the present, and then describe the present because of the unreal thing. That's what we're doing. That's what gives us the illusion of time. That's what gives us the illusion of causation. That would, that's what creates the story of ego, of individuality, of limitedness, of smallness. It just goes on and on and on and on, right? So permanency is a mere idea, born of the action of time. Time, again, depends on memory. Right? It's only taking that unreal past and comparing it to the change, to the different, very different looking present, and therefore de defining change, defining time. <clears throat> time, again, depends on memory. By permanency, you mean unfailing memory through endless time. You want to eternalize the mind, which is not possible. <clears throat> then what is eternal? That which does not change with time. You cannot eternalize a transient thing. Only the changeless is eternal. This is wonderful. And this is a wonderful practice. Uh, I just started it two days ago. <laughs> a little embarrassing that it never occurred to me to try it before. I decided instead of, instead of you know, doing that, that practice of I am Brahman, you know, I thought, why not just identify with the unchanging? 
That's something very concrete that I can hold on to. Brahman, I can't hold on to Brahman. But the idea of something unchanging, I can hold on to that. And so I, I focused, you know, and I, I was actually, <laughs> I was taking a shower and so I was feeling, you know, the water all running around the whole, that's the, the solution, the change going on all around you. So I'm standing there, the hot water running over my head, you know, running down my face, dripping off my nose, the whole nine yards. And I'm trying not to focus on all that. I'm trying to focus on the unchanging. I am unchanging. Look, the way this water runs over an unchanging body is the same way that I live this life in time, unchanged. You know, that there's, there's nothing there. And so you just start seeing everything that happens in the day, all change of your day is like water running off of you in the shower. It has nothing to do with you. It's not affecting you. You are that, the unchanging, always, always to the side uh, of the effects of what's going on around you. you know, don't be attached. I'm unchanging. I am the only thing not changing in, in this world, in this universe right now, you know, in your own private universe. Then what is eternal? That which does not change with time. You cannot eternalize a transient thing. Only the changeless is eternal, and it can only be pointed at by and by the senses and the mind. The senses and the mind cannot give you the answer to what is unchanging. They can't. But everything that they do will point to it, because everything that they do is being observed by that, by that unchanging absolute, that part of you which is hearing the lecture right now is the unchanging part of you. That part of you which is enjoying your mind right now. That awareness is the unchanging you. It is God. It is Brahman. It is that. And so let everything that changes point continuously at that. Because it is. And that's one of the most beautiful things about this joke of life. Is that everything without exception, <laughs> has been pointing directly at that which you seek for your entire experience. <laughs> Is that not hilarious? <laughs> every single thing in this universe right now, every experience, every thought, every feeling, is pointing directly at what you seek. But what they're pointing at is the you of you. They're not pointing at a body and at a mind. They're pointing at the you of you. But because you've forgotten, <laughs> you've gone into inadvertence, unawareness, you don't know what they're pointing at. You think they're pointing at fried chicken <laughs> or pizza or good friends or beautiful partners, but they're all pointing at you the blissful self. I'm familiar with the general sense of what you say. I do not crave for more knowledge. All I want is peace, Maharaj. You can have for the asking all the peace that you want. I'm asking. You must ask with an undivided heart and live an integrated life. Right? It has to be an earnest and a sincere quest for peace. Or do you really want peace? Chances are if you've learned, if you've gone inside your mind, if you've gone inside and asked questions and you've observed, you've seen, that you say on the outside that you quit, you, you're, you're seeking peace. And yet on the inside, you're seeking all manner of things that are not conducive to your peace. This is why, uh, this is what we're talking about when he says here, you must live with an undivided heart. You have to want one thing. You can't want disparate things. That's why, you know, that's, that's why desire and, and realization cannot live in the same room. They can't because it requires ignorance to desire. And ignorance is the veil of your reality. <clears throat> You must ask with an undivided heart and live an integrated life. How? Detach yourself from all that makes your mind restless. 
That's the simple question. That's the simple response right there. The simple, the simple solution to our problem. Detach yourself from all that makes your mind restless. That is the whole point of all of the yogas. Detachment. Understanding your nature. You are free. You are infinite. You are satisfied. You are love. You are wise. Detach yourself from all that makes your mind restless. Renounce all that disturbs its peace. If you want peace, deserve it. <laughs> if you want peace, deserve it. So yeah, so detach yourself from everything that makes your mind restless. That's the whole point of awareness. <coughs> to go in there and discern. What is it that makes your mind restless? So find that, get get to a moment where the mind's not restless, you know, right after meditation. Take a snapshot of that, <laughs> which immediately makes it unreal. But takes us take a snapshot of that, of that moment of non-restlessness coming out of your meditation and watch it. Stay acutely aware of it. And you will see all the little needles of things coming in through the senses that are going to undo, try to undo that, that equanimity, that peacefulness inside. And as long as you recognize them and renounce them on the spot, no, not that, no, not that, then that peace remains. Your nature remains. You remain in, in awareness of what you are but attach to any of those little needles coming in and it will poke you and wound you and it will cause a cycle of thinking which will wake up patterns of thought, which will wake up states of mind and boom, you're lacking peace, searching for, for, for your realization in an ununified mind with a divided heart that wasn't able to say no to something that caused the mind to be restless that didn't say no to something that caused dissatisfaction or, or an ignorance about the perfection of being. Detach yourself from all that makes your mind restless. Renounce all that disturbs its peace. If you want peace, then deserve it. Well, surely everybody deserves peace. <clears throat> Those only deserve it who don't disturb it. Right. That's 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 the other hard thing that's in 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 spiritual life to accept that you are your own disturbance. <laughs> you know, Vivekananda goes through a, a period of reckoning at the toward the end of his life, where he goes and recounts everything that he's done and sees how much selfishness was in it, how much impurity was in it, and all those things. And he says. In the end, he says, all power lies within you. There's nothing outside of yourself to blame for any of this. There's nothing outside of yourself to blame for anything. You have chosen your disturbances. You've chosen to fulfill your weaknesses. You've chosen to pursue your strengths. You've chosen to believe that you're not whole and thereby beginning a quest for wholeness. Surely everybody deserves peace. Those only deserve it who don't disturb it. In what way do I disturb peace? By being a slave to your desires and a slave to your fears. That is how you disturb your peace by being a slave to your desires and a slave to your fears. Even when they're justified, Maharaj, emotional reactions born of ignorance or inadvertence are never justified. Seek a clear mind, seek a clean heart. All you need is to keep quietly alert, inquiring into the real nature of yourself. This is the only way to peace.